Hi everyone, I'm Rice Engelang and I'm here with Jim McInnes, fine art photographer. Welcome, Jim. Well, thank you. So Jim, how would you characterize the art and work that you do? Well, um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I'm, not a, um, I'm not a landscape photographer. I'm not a, uh, a portrait photographer or a um, uh, uh, figure study uh, photographer, don't do sports photography, but all those things appear in work that I do. So I think probably um, eclectic would be a good description of my work. I, 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 I like to make photographs of things that I see and uh, just about anything that's in front of the camera, if it interests me, I'll make photographs of. And how did you originally get into your art? Well, that's... Um, I never intended to be a photographer. It wasn't something that uh, I set out it in childhood uh, to do. I know I read a lot of um, interviews <clears throat> and seem with photographers, and it seems that they talk about their mother or their father or an uncle or grandfather giving them a camera. But um, I started out my career as a uh, as a uh, mathematician, and uh, I, I taught at the University of California and, and at the University of Hawaii. And uh, then I started a software design business. And um, after 25 years of doing that, I was thinking of retiring. And um, I realized that I needed something to do. And so I uh, always liked taking photographs. And I uh, ended up going to a, um, an adult education class just to learn the basics, uh, f-stops and aperture, exposure values, things like that. And uh, then I, um, I just started making photographs. Um, and uh, over the years, I learned how to make, um, how, to, how to use Photoshop. I started off in film, but... Uh, uh, and I took some courses at uh, Otis College of uh, of Art and Design in Los Angeles, and uh, learned uh, darkroom and uh, some of the basics of uh, some more of the basics of photography. And the darkroom was really helpful for me. Um, the darkroom work at Otis um, because it gave me a background for my Photoshop work. And um, since my uh, since I did uh, software design and computer programming for 25 years, the uh, technical aspects of Photoshop are pretty easy. It's just a matter of learning a little te terminology, reading a few books, talking to a few people, things like that. Um, and then over time, I've been using Photoshop for probably 10 years now. And uh, you just um, experiment and learn more as you go along and develop new techniques. It's just a, it's just an evolution of a process that you learn. That's <clears throat> so, interesting uh, that you say that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I, I know other photographers who started off in some sort of software design background and have transitioned to photography. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that the transition is a lot smoother one since the the person is coming from a very technical background. Yeah, that's what uh, I think. If I um, if I didn't have a background in computers, it would probably have been a lot more difficult um, because Photoshop is very sophisticated. Um, but it's not the sophistication of Photoshop. It's um, how do you organize your files? Um, uh, how do you make backups? Uh, how do you use uh, the how do you interpret what you see in a book? You read them in, you read about a, a tool uh, in Photoshop, but um, how do you actually use that? How do you interpret the instructions, things like that? It's, uh, that's where the technical background comes in. It's the same thing with, the, with photography. Um, the um, learning how to use the camera, the technical aspects of photography are really, really very simple. You know, you, you need to know exposure, uh, uh, aperture, uh, shutter speed, uh, focal length, things like that. But um, that's that's really fairly trivial. Um, 
it's it, if you've got it if you've got a degree in uh, or background in computers and mathematics, it's really pretty simple. And it's it's actually not too difficult even if you don't have the, those backgrounds. So, so that being said, um, what are some of the challenges that you faced? Do you feel well, like? Yeah, well, the the biggest the biggest challenge was getting an education first of all, um, and that was a process of about fifteen years. Uh, I was in. I have a couple uh, advanced degrees in mathematics, and um, so that was that was the biggest that was a big challenge. The um, challenge in um, photography is to learn what makes a good picture, and um, in order to do that, uh, since I didn't have any background in art. Um, I started reading uh, about art history and reading um, about artists, not photographers necessarily, just artists. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of books on the life of uh, people like uh, Degas or um, um, Van Gogh, that type of thing. I made a, I've got a big collection of art books, and from there I also. Um, read books on people like Diane Arbus, uh, Lee Friedlander, Robert Frank, uh, uh, well-known names in photography. And um, so uh, assimilating all that and see how I could use it was a, was a big challenge because I started out with um, zero interest in art when I got into photography. And um, then um, I found the, the work fascinating and so I got more and more into it. So it, it took several years before I really felt I was starting to understand uh, how to make a good picture. Um, so the biggest challenge was learning, learning what is what makes good art, I guess. So Jim, what are you currently working on? Could you bring up some of your work and sure. maybe talk through it, please? Sure. Uh, currently, I'm, uh, uh, I have a a long-term project, which I will show you um, some work from, but uh, also a short-term project uh, on, um, I started doing, I'm not really a, a figure uh, photographer, but I, on occasion, enjoy making uh, photo, uh, figure work, uh, nude photography, basically. So I'll show you a couple uh, photos from, um, from the current work that I'm doing, although this is about a year old, I haven't, uh, I've kind of gotten out of this project a little bit. I'll get back into it again uh, later this year. I've got some plans for it, but um, this is with one, one, well, you can see something here first that's from my Venice work, but uh, let's go back to the beginning here. Can you see that now? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is, uh, uh, some uh, from a session I did with a photographer named Amanda. She's based in New York, and uh, she was out here for a few a uh, few weeks uh, working with another uh, another photographer and uh, who I happen to know. And he uh, arranged for us to get together. So um, this is uh, some work done with uh, everything that I do is in. Everything I shoot is uh, in in uh, raw format. I don't shoot JPEGs generally. So I've taken this photo of her, which is a studio uh, photograph made with uh, with one strobe and a and a hot light. And by the way, I, I know very little about studio lighting. These are things that I got lucky on, I guess. Uh, the, the the lighting seemed to work. Um, and what I've done here with a lot of the current work that I do is using uh, textures, and um, uh, basically those are uh, files that just well they have a texture. They could be uh, a rock, or they could be uh, they could emulate uh, uh, tin type or uh, wet plate collodion, and I um, merge that in Photoshop with the uh, with the photo that I've taken, and then I use some of the technical, some of the Photoshop tools, um, mostly curves and uh, a few blend modes to make these uh, to make these images the way I want. I, I really never know where I'm going to end up when I start uh, with a photo. I just 
take a photo that appeals to me and then um, apply one, two, or three different texture layers on top of it, can maybe convert it like I did here to black and white. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of like starting off on a journey. You don't know where you're, what the destination is until you get there. And um, that's, that's basically what I do. I, I really almost never have a real concept of what I want. I just do a lot of experimentation. This, this photo probably took, oh, a day or day and a half to uh, actually get it to where it is right now. So um, why nudes? Um, well, um, they're, they're, that's a good question. Um, they, uh, I've seen a lot of nudes uh, in my readings, and I've always enjoyed seeing um, the artistic presentation of the fact. I do mostly female nudes, a female body. Um, uh, experimenting with light and form there's nothing more beautiful than uh, than uh, the human form i think in, in in all its sizes and shapes um and it's uh, it, you know it's something i uh i'm not compelled to do or it's not it's not a major facet of my work but it's something interesting and it's a challenge you know it's a challenge to find lighting to find the shadows to find the form the shape uh, that you want um uh, so basically, it's, I guess it's a challenge um, is one of the reasons I do it. Um, and do you want to go through some I more think. pictures and maybe talk us through the process you use uh, mm -hmm. to get to that point, please? Sure. Well, here's a, this is the same woman. Um, and um, again, this, is, uh, this whole uh, series with her is studio work. I had a studio. I had access to the studio for about three months and uh, took advantage of that when she was uh, just happened that she was out here when I had the, the uh, access to the studio. So this one is just a, pretty much a straight photograph of Amanda. And in Photoshop, all I've done is um, take strips of um, black and layered them in a grid so i've got i think in this one there's three horizontal and three vertical uh strips of uh just black and i've uh, changed the um opacity on those strips so that you can see in certain places like down here you can see some shadowing and that type of thing and um uh, and then messed around with uh, with a few curves and things like that to get this the way I want it. I like the idea of just having. She has this incredible look, and um, I, uh, I I like that about her. So that's why I highlighted the um, her face and uh, arm, and that the the, um, the the breast and leg are important features, but they're um, more secondary, I think, to give to give some context, uh, I guess, is the only way I could explain it, uh, to, the, um, to the photograph. Um, and I'll show you another one. One of the, in, I think this one, yeah. Um, I have been influenced a lot by Japanese photographers, uh, in particular uh, a photographer named um, Hiroshi Sugimoto and another photographer named uh, Maseo Yamamoto. And um, they, um, although this, it's the, it's the, not the style, but it's the, um, well, I guess it's the pose here that uh, I was influenced by. This, this one was influenced heavily by, uh, by uh, Hiroshi Sugimoto. Um, and um, I started off with the, his idea was to have a uh, this bowl and um, uh, person the, the female standing at the at the wash basin or the bowl um, with um, an object. I think he had a sponge in his. I don't remember for sure, but I I, I like that. So I experimented uh, with Amanda on this, and then um, because I experiment a lot. I um, decided to try to produce 
a photo that was uh, that looked that was basically emulates a uh, wet plate collodion um, negative, basically a glass plate, and that's why I came up with this. So this is this is a just a straight photograph, and um, in Photoshop I put a curve adjustment layer on it. And then I selected a blend mode called difference. And, uh, and, and the result is what you see here. It, it basically uh, inverts an image. That's, that's another way to do it. In Photoshop, you could actually take the base image and do a control I, which inverts it and makes it. Uh, and, and, if you, and if you put a black and white, um, a black and white adjustment layer, which I've done here, uh, it will come out looking like a um, like a negative, and then what you see around the edges here. This is a a, a texture overlay that's supposed to emulate a um, wet plate collodion again. So that's how I get that ragged, those strange edges, that type of thing. Um, that's great. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, the uh, that, there's another one here that has the same idea. This one is uh, influenced by. Um, uh, uh, Yamamoto, Masao Yamamoto. Um, so, um, it, and it's basically the same process as the previous one. Um, just different, just different blend modes, different layers. Of course, um, some of the some of the work here uh, is also done with curves, uh, where I maybe set up a, a luminosity um, blend mode uh, to to affect the contrast, that type of thing. Um, I use curves extensively in my work. Um, they're very precise, and um, uh, I, I, in, a, in a particular photo, I may have four or five curves, all with different blend modes affecting, and maybe masks affecting different areas of the of the photograph. Um, so. That's, I mean, it's pretty, it can be complicated. And my, my files, uh, this, this particular file, what you're seeing here is JPEGs, but this particular file, uh, the raw file, TIFF file, I save all my photos in TIFFs. And it's probably in the 800 megabyte range. Some of wow. them, do, yeah, some of them get more than a, uh, more than a gigabyte in size. But um, the, um, the uh, cost of disk space today is so cheap that um, you know uh, I get a, a, a five terabyte five terabyte drive, and uh, you know this uh, one gigabyte file is nothing, relatively speaking, you know, in size. Um, was that flower always there? Well, you know, yes, I had her uh, hold that flower. Um, this is one of the few. Uh, things that I that I plan, I generally don't plan my photographs, but I, I thought about this particular shoot um, with uh, this uh, flower in mind because I, what I saw with uh, Yamamoto's work. And so what I've done here is it, uh, I've actually put a mask on that flower to bring, because it was a white flower, it's a, 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 a daisy of some type, I forget the name of it now, but um, so I um if when i originally did this uh, that flower because it's a white flower and the process is an inversion process the white flower turns black um so what i did was i um put a, a layer mask on there and masked out the the part of the um of the of the uh, curve that uh cr the uh the uh, uh difference curve to uh, bring up the whiteness of the flower. It's much more effective than having a black flower there, I think. And how did you isolate the flowers specifically? Uh, yes, on the, uh, originally when I did it, uh, the curve was just, uh, I changed the blend mode after putting on some um, uh, uh, contrast curves and things to get the image the way I thought was nice. And when I um, put on the curve for the, um, uh, difference curve to, to, to invert it, basically. Um, 
I saw that, yeah, yeah, the, it didn't look good in black. So that's uh, yeah, on the layer mask for the curve. I uh, just masked out, masked, masked out the flower. Um, so yeah, I isolated the flower. It wasn't, but it wasn't a separate curve. It was just the just the one uh, difference curve with uh, with a with a that that area masked out was all there was to it. Um, and how would you say that your your study of the past traditional artists you named in the beginning of our conversation play mm -hmm. into the end results of the imagery you create? Well, um, it's it's more, I don't know how to explain it. Um, it is an influence. Um, I, I don't really copy directly, but it's, um, it's an amalgamation of influences. So you start looking at art and you see different styles, you see different uh, techniques or, and you may not know what those techniques are, but you like the result of those techniques. So you try to figure out how could I do that? Uh, especially, you know, uh, many of the things I looked at uh, originally were painters, like I said, uh, Degas, Van Gogh, um, you know, um, uh, Mary Cassatt, the Impressionist. Um, so there's no direct um, link between the techniques of painting and the techniques in Photoshop. You try, you try to emulate, you try to figure out how to emulate uh, or approximate um, uh, the work that you've seen. Um, and it's just, it, I don't know, it, it's just like life, you know, um, you go through life and you have, inf you have experiences that influence where you are at a particular point, at that particular point in your life. And that's the same thing, the same way that um, uh, when you study art, or you study painting or photography or whatever, the, all those things influence you um, and, and, and um, just make you what you are at that particular time. I, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's, you know, that's the way, that's the way it works for me anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, well, let me show you. I think there's one more here. Um, here's another one of the same <clears throat> woman. And this, this this particular one, it can, again, you can see the um, the uh, idea of um, a tintype or a wet plate collodion. It's a little uh, contrasty and... Um, <clears throat> the um, but yet there's you can see in here there's some um, um, roughness I guess I don't know how else to explain it but I um, also was influenced by the work of Lee Friedlander and uh, Bill Brandt the British photographer and their use of wide angle lenses and so you can see in her arm you can see the wide angle distortion and you can see the difference in scale, the left arm here and the right arm. Um, I just like that. Um, I like that look. <clears throat> um, it's always fun to play with, play around and try different things. And um, one of the things that I, I like a lot if it's done right is um, wide angle distortion. Uh, Lee Friedlander made some, uh, and so did Bill Brand for a matter, that matter of fact, made some wonderful nudes um that um used like probably a 28 millimeter uh lens and um so uh feet for example if the if the model is laying on a couch and you're at the the photographer is at the foot end of the couch and makes a photograph with a wide angle lens those feet are going to be very large and the and the uh, the body is going to have the wide angle distortion where the the, f the further elements become smaller. And uh, that's what I was trying on this. So. How do you uh, do uh, the black and white on your photos? Well, um, <clears throat> because I shoot 35 millimeter digital, the raw files, uh, and, and I don't have, I, I, I never shoot in, uh, some cameras have the ability to shoot monochrome, but I never do that because, um, 
uh, then I don't have the access to the color channels that I want. And um, so what I do is um, shoot raw. When I bring it into Photoshop, um, I put a, uh, Photoshop has a tool called uh, black and white, um, what is it? Uh, um, it? Basically it's a black and white tool. Or, um, it used to be called uh, channel mixer, which they still have, but now they've got a black and white um, a conversion tool. And that has with it, it's got eight different um, color channels. We've got red, green, blue, magenta, um, cyan, and purple, I think. And uh, you can, those are sliders that you can move around and uh, affect the, um, uh, the saturation um, of the image for those channels. And that affects the tonal range uh, on the black and white. So, and then also um, another thing that you can do is below the black and white conversion layer, uh, you can also put a um, hue saturation layer. And that has a little bit more control because you can, uh, you can change the luminosity and the, um, uh, and the uh, hue and the saturation. Um, so with the black and white adjustment layer itself, you can only change one of those values and change basically the saturation. Um, but um, with the uh, hue saturation layer below it, you can change those values again based on the, the, the luminosity, saturation, and hue of those channels. And uh, that can dramatically affect your black and white image. Um, and it'd be interesting because if you've been um, deactivate the black and white layer, you get some really, you can get some really intensely ugly colors that in color, but in, they turn into beautiful uh, grayscale when you, when you uh, convert them. Or why black and white? Um, well, you know, not all of my work is black and white. Um, uh, a lot of it is color work, but the black and white is, if you read this, it sounds, it sounds, kind of, um, well, a lot of people say this, that's all I'll say is, um, it has a, uh, it has a classic element to it, but, um, you eliminate the distractions of color. And so what you're seeing is really an abstraction of real life because we, we see in color, we don't see in black and white, but, um, uh, sometimes color can be very, very distracting. And you want to um, concentrate on a particular aspect of a, of a photograph, the, basically the tonal values of it. Uh, and uh, when you do that, um, one of the best ways is to, is to convert it to black and white or grayscale. Um, so that's why, and I, I just like the look of it. You get much more dramatic effects. Um, uh, with the, uh, you know, with the grayscale image. And there, there's, there's also um, an, another reason. Now, now, black and white is one form of monochrome. So a monochrome image could be uh, an image that is a brown tone, like a sepia image. That's also monochrome. Um, and um, I, uh, you know, some of the work I'll show you in a minute, is work I've done in Venice, Italy. And um, it, it's on the, uh, every year in Venice, they have a um, carnival and it is a celebration um, during Lent or just before Lent, um, just like the carnival in Rio or the Mardi Gras in, um, in New Orleans. They're, they're all based around the celebration of Lent. And as part of the carnival, um, there is what they call them, <clears throat> excuse me, they call the mask festival. And people come from, people I call performers, uh, they, they call themselves costumes. 
but they come from all over the world. Most of them are French or Italian, a lot of Germans, a few Americans, but they, they come at their own expense to spend, um, I think Carnival is like two weeks long. They'll, they'll, they'll come as part of a mask festival. Um, and they make their, usually make their own costumes or have their costumes made. And they're incredibly ornate, beautiful costumes. And um, uh, they let you photograph them. They just walk around uh, the city of Venice, mostly around St. Mark's uh, Piazza and uh, pose for you. There's no exchange of money. Um, it's it's uh, something they love doing. And uh, it's not only in Venice that this happens, but in France also, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, carnival type um, um, events in various parts of Europe. Um, and so getting back to why I started on that, um, the Venice is an ancient city and um, the, the use of masks in Venice became very popular. It started someplace around the thir middle 1300s. So Jim, and, before we, uh, before uh, we get too, too deep sure. into the, the history oh, yeah. of uh, Venice, do you want to switch right. to those pictures? So, sure, yeah, yeah, that was a good idea. Uh, yeah. Let me do that. Uh, here's a, here is a, one of the photos I took of one of the performers in Venice. Um, and as I said, you can um, you can see how uh, ornate uh, uh, this costume is. Um, this was this was um, taken at St. Mark's. This is outdoor. Uh, all of my all of my photos in Venice use just natural uh, light, whatever is available. Uh, this particular perform, I believe, is from Germany, if I remember correctly. Um, so, he, so you can see here um, what uh, some, of the, some of the things I do, uh, what I would call more straight photography. This is basically um, the image with a couple of uh, luminosity curves on it is, is about all there is to this. Um, but since since the mass festival is so old, so um, what I what I decided to do was uh, a lot of my images uh, of Venice are are monochrome, uh, either black and white or sepia, and um, so here is an example. Um, <clears throat> these are two performers uh, who I happen to know, uh, who I met there, and um, they've been coming here for. Uh, probably 10 years or so. And uh, uh, their names are Thierry and Carmela. And I, I decided to make this monochrome to give you a feel for what it might have been like uh, to make a photograph in the 1850s or 1860s, because you didn't have, you didn't have color photography then. Um, and I think that goes well with the ancient architecture of the of the city of uh, Venice, which has been around since about the third century um, AD, I guess. Um, so I sort of try to I'm trying here to give it a uh, like I said a feel of of, uh, uh, of an 18th or 19th century photographer with uh, the type of work that they might produce because that's what they did. They were all black and white or or sepia toned. Or selenium toned. Uh, um, <clears throat> so that's one. Here's another one that I decided to uh, try. This was last, <clears throat> excuse me, last year. And um, when I go to Venice, I'm there. Usually, I join up uh, with. There's a group of about seven or eight. Uh, it varies year to year of uh, photographers from from Norway who I. Um, hook up with we all stay at the same hotel and so last year i had the idea of doing some night photography um and with with basically candlelight so again what i tried to do here is give it an i a feel of um performers in the in the uh in the 1800s or 
war, or not performers, but people in the 17, 1800s, um, and uh, give it that. Uh, there's a lot of effect here. You can see that the, the uh, if if you look at if you look at uh, uh, wet plate collodion uh, photographs, those uh, negatives that they make have a lot of uh, imperfections, uh, lots of maybe dust spot, maybe. Uh, I, I won't go into wet plate collodion, but it's a it's a substance, um, light sensitive substance that you put on a glass plate and make a photograph with that. Well, the uh, substance starts off liquid, and so it's sticky, and so there's imperfections, there's dust, there's there's things that happen on the uh, on the plate itself that affects the um, affects the image, and that's what I tried to emulate here to show the imperfections of a of a wet plate collodion uh, photograph. So where do you get the textures for those imperfections? Oh, that, well, you know, there's a lot of them on, um, you, you can Google for uh, tin type textures, uh, wet plate textures. You can go up on Flickr, for example. There's a number of free ones up there. There's ones that you can pay for. Um, um, uh, you know, just basically a web search will do it. And, and you know, there's um, there's something, let's see, um, I can't remember the name of the website right now, but um, you can find, look around, uh, even Facebook, um, there'll be people that do this type of thing and, and uh, friend them and, and ask them where they get their textures, things like that. I mean, it's just, there's, there must be million, there must be hundreds, if not thousands, of sites uh, where you can find these things, and many of them, like I said, are free, which is what I, which is what I generally use. Um, the problem you'll have with them, uh, one of the problems you'll have with them is when I my my TIFF files are generally something like twelve by nineteen in inches and three hundred DPI. Uh, these textures will be sometimes six, four by six or three by two at 72 DPI. So when you use those, uh, put them uh, into your TIFF file, uh, they're going to be very small and you have to basically expand them to cover the, the larger area of, the, of your image. And when you do that, uh, you get a lot of pixelation. And so the, you have to have uh, one of the newer versions of Photoshop, like CS6, or uh, one of the versions of what, what, that have uh, what they call smart objects. And so what you do is you take your texture layer in Photoshop, you convert it to a smart object. And then smart object is a, um, a vector-based uh, uh, process. And uh, with the vector-based layer, you can expand it, you can change it, you can do all kinds of things to it. Never, it never really, it, do, it doesn't have a, a problem with causing pixelation. So it, because it's uh, mathematic, mathematically based, you can expand uh, your small texture layer into uh, something four or five times as large <clears throat> and not have any not have any degra degradation of that layer. So that's so you have I mean. to convert it into a smart object first. Yeah, I convert it into a smart object. Uh, I, I, you can do that when you open up the texture layer because you have your, you have your base image, the image that you took, you bring up the texture layer uh, as a, another image in Photoshop and then you just drag it over and drop it onto onto your image and uh, of course again like I said it's going to be small and at that point you can convert that layer you just go up to the layers menu and there'll be an option uh, scroll down a little bit there'll be an option say convert to smart object and then <clears throat> that's what you do and then you then you then I use uh, uh, edit transform scale um what is it um yeah scale and uh and expand it to cover the to cover the image that i want so um so that's um that's about it there there's one more here just to 
give you a little black uh, idea of black and white. This is just a straight Photoshop image with the that um, when I say a straight, I not a lot of manipulation on it, not a lot of changing, uh, except to, to darken right here. You can see I, I wanted that to be real black. Um, you you hear uh, people talk about um, shadow detail uh, in a photo. You should have shadow detail in it. Well, if you look back at pictorialist photographs, uh, these are um, photographs made from around the 1860s, maybe to the maybe the first part of the 20th century. Um, many of them were very very dark, no shadow detail, and it's I, I think it's quite effective. So. Um, I'm not a, I, sometimes it's important to have shadow detail, but something like this, I didn't want that shadow detail. I wanted to just be a real stark contrast with the, with the uh, white back, the relatively white background. <clears throat> and that's again done simply with a, a couple Photoshop curves is all, all it takes to do. And some masking. So I masked, I, I masked out the, the woman in the umbrella. And with that mask, uh, that's what I applied the Photoshop luminosity curve to and just brought it right down. And what do you use to select just the woman and the umbrella? Well, OK. Um, so in Photoshop, there is a, a tool called um, Quick Edit. It's in your tools, um, your tools a menu or toolbar that's you. I keep it on the left hand side of my screen. And um, with quick edit, what it does is it lets you just use a brush painted uh, with a black color to just paint over the area that you want uh, to select. And then it creates a selection mask. And with that selection mask um, active, you bring you then activate a a new curve layer and uh, the uh you will see on the curve itself you'll see the edit mask will be black except where the um area that you've selected is that'll be white and that'll be that will be the area that's affected by what you do with the curve so that's that's basically the process that i used here so just painted the woman in, painted the mask for the woman, activated a curve. It was set up so that only the areas that I painted are, are um, going to be affected by the curve. And, and then I think I put the curve itself affect blend mode to multiply and brought down the black values. Um, yeah, sh really sharply. So I think if you put a, if, if you look at the actual values here, they'd be real close to pure black. If you want to stop sharing your screen, um, okay. we can continue Let's... on. And you're back. Awesome. Here we are. Okay. Yeah. So, Jim, where do you find the models for your shoots? Well, um, most of them are women who I know. Um, and um, uh, the, the one who you saw, Amanda, um, is the only professional I've ever used. And um, you know, you remember Paul Blyden from uh, from our bag. Yeah, he's yeah. a member of um, of a site called Model Mayhem, and uh, the photographers. It's a it's a site where you where photographers and models and makeup artists can get together. And um, he um, Paul knew this uh, met this woman Amanda. Uh, through through model mayhem, she came out and uh, when he was living in Manhattan Beach, he had a big house and uh, models who were going to be in the area, he would uh, let them stay at his house for whatever period of time, and then it would be an exchange of uh, you know you can stay here if we can do some photo sessions, and that's how how I met her was through Paul, and it was really it was for her it was like really a two hour thing. That's, I met her. I met her a couple days before, just so that she could be feel comfortable. You know, it's for me. It's always a question of uh, you know, a woman going going someplace into a 
a closed room with somebody, a guy she's never met. And um, I, so I try to make them feel comfortable with me. So they, you know, and, and if they're comfortable, they're much easier uh, and pose more naturally. So that's, that's where I, that's where I met her. But the rest of them have been, have been female friends of mine, you know, and it's nice to work with somebody that, you know, um, uh, I've been working with a woman in North Carolina who I met at a workshop and, um, uh, uh, and we've been friends for, that was in 2008 and she lives in North Carolina now. And I go back there a couple times. Oh, every, every few years and we get together and, you know, make photos. So, Jim, what do you love about creating art? Ah, it's the, it's the creation process. That's what's really cool. Um, uh, you know, for me, it's an exploration. Um, I, I think of myself more as a, um, an artist who uses photography rather than, uh, than a photographer. There are so many uh, absolutely incredible photographers out there, and um, uh, I I just enjoy making photographs and then seeing if I can uh, express something. I, I don't know what that thing is. It's what I feel at the time uh, using my <clears throat> using my um, using my Photoshop skills. So it's, it's all about the creation and what you can do with it. And some of the work that I have, I'll have three or four different versions of it, depending on the ideas at the time. Uh, some will be monochrome, some will be um, uh, wet plate uh, emulations, some will be um, uh, color images, some will use, maybe some will use a texture or something like that, because these things all give different interpretations uh, to the image itself. So uh, I, I I've gone back to photographs that I made four or five years ago and completely reinterpreted those photographs. That's the, that's the great thing about digital, you know. It's very difficult to do something like that with film, but with digital, it's really fairly easy. So um, it's just a thrill of seeing something neat, even if nobody else likes it. If you like it, that's great, you know. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. What, what, do, you, what do you hate about creating art? <laughs> uh, actually, I don't hate anything about it. Uh, well, sometimes, sometimes when you create something you think is absolutely wonderful and other people just pan it, you know, that's, that's kind of a blow to your ego, you know. Uh, so maybe that's the negative part of it. But I, I really don't hate it at all. I spend, I, 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 I photograph not every day, but I photograph frequently. But um, I also work on my photos uh, almost every day. I do some Photoshop work. Either well, I do some some artwork. I either make a photo and then come back and uh, do something with it in Photoshop, or I uh, bring up images that I've created previously and work on on those images. And um, this comes from my days of uh, uh, as a graduate student, um, I, I spend eight, 10, 12 hours a day studying. So I have the ability to work uh, intensely for a number of hours. And, and, and I brought that over, I bring that over to my, uh, uh, to, to, to my Photoshop work. Uh, I, sometimes I'm up at seven in the morning, I'm working until seven at night on photographs, you know, doesn't make, uh, it's not a really well-rounded, uh, you know, that's not, it doesn't make me well-rounded, but it certainly gives me a lot of satisfaction. No, I hear you. I find it very satisfying to edit photos. What do you shoot with, Jim? Yeah, well, um, I originally started with film. Uh, I had a, well, I had a Nikon with the, the first camera. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about when I was a kid or when I was, you know, 20 years old and I had a brownie or a Kodak, but uh, my first um, bigger camera was a Nikon uh, F1, I believe it was. And uh, then I bought a, um, a Canon AE-1 film uh, camera. 
and uh, bought lenses for it. And then when I decided, when I, when I realized the, the, the value of making digital images, I bought a Canon um, 1DS Mark II camera. And I've been using Canon ever since. Right now, uh, the problem with the 1DS Mark II, I mean, it was great for um, being the first full frame digital camera, but uh, low light situations, which I do a lot of, became, it can be really, really noisy. And um, <clears throat> so I, when, the, when the 5D Mark III came out, I switched to that, and that's what I'm shooting right now. Um, and how do you like the 5D Mark III? I'm sorry? How do you like the 5D Mark III? I, I like it. Yeah, I like it a lot. Uh, it's a full frame. I think it's 23 megapixels or something like that. Um, and um, it's, it handles noise much better. Uh, some, of the, some of the night photos that I do now are at uh, ISO 3200. Uh, I know people make them higher than that, but I found that's about the threshold. Um, that works for me anyway. Um, and uh, many times I don't, at night, I don't even use a tripod, you know. Um, wow. It's, yeah, it's really, a, it's really a cool, cool camera. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really not the camera. I mean, the camera is a tool and it has functionality that's, uh, that can be helpful to you. But um, it's what, um, what your, vision, I guess, for lack of a better word, uh, brings, uh, you know, brings the party that's important. Um, I tell people all the time, <clears throat> I know people will argue this and probably will never be settled, but there's, there are people who say, oh, the technical aspects are the most important, are, 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 are equally important or more important. I categorize it the way you want, but, um, you know, the, the, the technical, I, I, I think the technical aspects uh, play a supporting role to the uh, to the to the main character, which is the image. Uh, and um, I, I know you can have perfectly technically perfect photographs that are boring as hell, you know. But if you have a, a nice, a really good artistic interpretation of a photograph. The technicals are much less important. So um, I, I, I stress when I talk to people, I stress the the artistic creation, the artistic value of the photograph. That um, makes a lot of sense. Like yeah. That. Well, you, yeah. It I, to me it does. And 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 then if you look at photographs from the 1800s, 1900s, uh, early 1900s, when a camera was merely a box with a lens and a light sensitive material. And you, there was no, there were no um, light meters, you know, uh, you had very crude lenses that didn't have, they weren't really sharp. When I say crude, it's relatively, but um, Look at the incredible photographs made by people like uh, Stieglitz or uh, Julia Cameron. Um, yeah, you look at the work they've done with basically a, just a crude, like I said, box with a lens. And you'll know that you know the technical part is really not that important. It's important, but it's not the most important. It's what the photographer, the artist, brings to the to the party with their with their vision. Right, right, definitely. Okay. Um, that being said, do you have any words of wisdom for aspiring artists? Yeah. Um, well, I think the well, the most important things I think are what we just talked about. Learn, just learn the basics, the technical basics, um, because that's that will get that will take you a long way. Uh, after that, I think you need to, at least from my perspective, uh, study art, study photography, learn what went before. Um, you cannot, you, you can't understand history, you can't understand current events 
if you don't understand history. And that same thing happens with photography. You can't understand where photography is today if you don't know something about the history of photography and art in general. Um, and, and read as much as you can, look at as many photographs as you can. I probably see two or 300 photographs a day. You know? From which platform? Well, I see a lot on, on uh, Facebook. I see a lot on photo. There's, a, there's a, uh, another site called Photo Community. That's F-O-T-O community.com. Um, and some incredible uh, artists up there. Um, and so I would, I would, I would do a lot of, uh, a lot of studying, a lot of looking, um, and then I would make a lot of pictures, you know. Um, and also, uh, art is, a, if you want, if you want to make a lot of money in art, you're probably not going to, you know, it's a very difficult, uh, it's a very, it's very difficult to make money in, um, unless you know um i mean people do it obviously you know but um just like professional sports you know one in 10 million makes it to the big leagues you know i don't yeah. so do it because you love it and uh and then uh if you can make me at it that's that's wonderful but uh one of the one of the people i studied with a guy named john humble a la-based uh, photographer um, uh, sold, uh, had a following, sold his work for seven, $8,000, um, each, each print, um, but supplemented his, his, his living with teaching and which you see a lot of people do. So yeah, you, you know, you can sell work for a lot of, for a lot of money, but you can't sell a lot of work for a lot of money probably. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, um, that makes sense. So the, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I've had, I've had uh, a bit of success doing this, but not, um, you know, I, I can't, uh, fortunately if I'm retired. I don't uh, in a financial position. I don't have to make a lot of money on it. Not so ha have you been selling your work, Jim? I, I've been selling uh, a little bit of it. Uh, um, I don't really, I don't really try to sell my work very much because marketing skill and getting marketing skills are different than photographic skills. And you have to either you have to have someone market your work for you, or you have to split your time between art and sales and um i'm when you do that then you're working for you're working for yourself but you're really um uh, well, well let me back up um the reason i don't have clients i'm not a commercial photographer is because um i don't want to give my time to somebody else and when you're when you're a professional or when you're a commercial photographer or even a professional photographer, you have to give your work in some ways to someone else. And I did that for uh, when I was running my uh, consulting business. I did that for 35, uh, no, 25 years. And uh, I just don't want to do that anymore. I want to have the time for myself and do the things that I want to do. Um, and I think as a as a um, as an artist, um, well, you just have to make that decision. Uh, so I do sell some of my work, but I don't push it. Um, I um, I had work. I've got work in a, a, a couple galleries right now. Um, but you have to. You really have to have. I think in today's world, you really have to have gallery representation, or um, if you can, if you're lucky enough to uh, work for something like National Geographic's or. Um, uh, you know, um, if you're a Magnum photographer, something like that, you um, you have more opportunity. You know, uh, you have more opportunity because they bring clients to you. you have more opportunity to sell uh, your work. But um, yeah, I just I just don't have the desire to to really push it. So, um, now how do you price your work for selling? 
Oh, well, you know, the current thing is based on size. So if it's uh, eight by 10, it's a hundred dollars. I'm picking numbers here, right? If it's a, if it's twice as large, it's a thousand dollars. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, huh. <laughs> you know, um, but, um, I generally, uh, try to find out like certain small galleries, for example, uh, some of the ones on the East Coast that I've been working with, uh, they're, you have to look at the clientele. Uh, I have a, I, uh, had work in a gallery in Vermont and, um, uh, or, uh, yeah, we'll say Vermont uh, or in uh, Rhode Island. And if there is a big photo community or big art community, there, um, people who in uh, who really enjoy art and really uh, like to collect it, then your prices can be higher. Look at it's it's interesting because if you look in Redondo Beach, there's no art market there. Um, the ga they don't have any galleries because people don't buy art. But if you go seven or eight miles, I don't know what the distance distance is to Culver City. I remember going up there for one of their art walks that they had on Thursday nights or whatever. And I went into this, this really great gallery. And um, I don't remember, it was paintings, I believe. And they had like 90% of the work on the walls were sold. Um, and then I came back, to see it again to a week later, and they were hanging a new show because they said they sold so much they didn't have that show anymore. You know? Wow, which gallery was that? I, that I don't, I just do not remember. This was like five years ago, six years ago. But the, but the point is that the communities can be seven or eight miles uh, apart and it can be a completely different art market. So what you, when you're pricing your work, you have to, you have to consider what the market is. So if I sell something in Vermont for $500 for a, uh, 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 eight, uh, uh, 10 by 15 or, or a 14 by 20 uh, photograph, um, I might be able to sell that uh, same uh, photograph in um, Culver City, let's say, for $2,000, you know. So you just have to know the market. That's how I price it. And then, yeah, you know. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's a gut feel, you know. Um, you can sell... You can sell one photograph for ten thousand dollars, or you can sell, you know, a hundred photographs for a hundred dollars, you know, or two hundred dollars. So, and you're going to have a bigger market for the lower priced uh, photographs, obviously. I mean, I go into galleries and I see um, uh, or shows, and I'll see four or five photographs sold, um, and they're a hundred dollars each. And all the ones that are five or six hundred dollars, nobody buys. <laughs> you know? So it, it depends on. It's easier. I think. I think selling art uh, is really a um, uh, impulse. And uh, you see something you like, you buy it, or when you walk out um, and you start thinking about it, you never come back. So you know, if it's priced right, people buy it right now because today a lot of people have a hundred bucks in their pocket, you know, what, pick a number. I don't know. It could be $50, whatever. So, yeah. So what's next for you, Jim? Well, I'm going back to, um, Italy in three weeks. I'll be back in Venice. Uh, I'm going to, uh, this, this Venice project I've been doing for 10 years now. Uh, I've been to Venice every year for the last nine years and uh then i was there in 2006 or 2000 i forget but um so i'm going back there um and then uh to to uh, for 10 days i think i'll be there this year um after that uh, i was contacted by a, a a guy who writes haiku and um he uh wants to uh, collaborate uh, using my photographs and uh, pairing it with haiku and um, uh, it's called Haiga I guess I don't know the pronunciation it's spelled H-A-I-G-A I believe uh, 
And he says that uh, the haiku is, uh, when you do this, is meant to not, it's meant to des not describe, but give a feeling for uh, the work, you know. So, uh, so I, what he's, he's published in uh, a number of magazines and periodicals or haiku societies. So he's, he's got a little bit of a following. And uh, my idea is to um, take uh, our collaborative work and create a, a, a book out of it. Uh, I'm, I published a number of blurb books and um, uh, so I have some expertise on it. It'd be kind of fun to do with him. So that, that, that's the immediate uh, things that I'm planning. And then I've got a couple of books in the work uh, that they've been in the work for a long time. I go back and forth. I work on them for a long time and then I get distracted doing other things. And so I'll get back to a couple of those um, uh, because I'll be, after, after I get back from Venice, I'll be in, um, in Iceland for about 10 days in March. And after I get back from those, then I'll start cranking up the projects again. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So where can people find you? Well, um, I, I'm on Facebook. Um, I have uh, work on photo community and I have a website. Um, and my, I'll spell my name because uh, nobody spells it properly. Uh, uh, it's McKinnis and that's M-C-K-I-N-N i s s um so my website is jim mckinnis photography.com uh facebook i'm under jim mckinnis and the same thing in photo community now uh, my website i haven't updated for a number of years but um on photo community that's fairly up to date so if you want to see some of my um some of my uh more current work uh go to photo community and i've got a couple thousand photos up there Great. Well, thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate your time today. Well, this has been great. Um, I was a little nervous, but it seems like it went okay. <laughs> great. Yeah. Uh, okay, Jim. Well, okay. I'll, I'll talk to you later then. Thank you again. Oh, and yeah. thank you. Uh -huh. See ya. Okay. See ya. Bye. Bye. That's our show for today. If you have any questions, send an email to me, rye at makephotoart.com, or please visit our site at makephotoart.com.